Welcome everybody to our session on the angels of God. This is being recorded for ChristadelphianVideos.org and my name is Ron Cowie from South Australia. Hello everybody, we're coming back to our consideration of the angels of God, those that stand by us, and particularly we're going to look at this continuation of how the angels are at work with God's people in This Is Study 9. As always, we just remember that we're looking at the third of the three reasons that we have to study the angels to appreciate how God sent them to work in our lives. And we've considered the life of Joseph, considered the life of Jacob, two great examples of the angels working behind the scenes. In the case of Joseph, there was no recognized in, uh, meeting with any angel until perhaps he thought about that later in life when he said that Elohim to send me before you to preserve life. And I think Joseph probably realized later on that that certain man that found him was actually an angel of God. Jacob, of course, had 40 years where there was very little indication that God was working in his life, and yet God was working all the time, even though he was going through very difficult circumstances. We noted that Jesus talked about individual angels in Matthew 18, verse 10, and that in the book of Zechariah and in the book of Psalms, you have this proof that there are individual angels. So taking that as 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 accepted, let's go on now and look at the angels working with, with some other people in the Bible. We did note, of course, a very important principle, and that is that the work of the angels is to seal or complete, to finish the work of God of impressing divine thinking on those that God has called. And so we always remember that whatever the angels do, it's with the object of the final outcome for the, the maturity of the saints of God. So they will... Sometimes deliver, sometimes they will not deliver, sometimes they will bring things to pass. They will put challenges in front of us, all with the object of finishing that impression of divine thinking on our minds. And we noted in Proverbs that it was about acknowledging God in all of our ways and then God can direct our path. So that's the basis of this study. So angelic angels, the angels are what the Bible calls watchers or even holy ones. And you find this in the book of Daniel. 4 verse 7, and this matter is by the decree of the watchers, even the holy ones. And so these angels have a particular work to actually be God's eyes in the earth. Not that God can't see us or know us through his spirit, he can. But he's actually chosen to let the angels do the seeing and the, and the, the touching and the handling of his saints upon the earth um, and to actually have them involved in reporting back to him what they see and hear. So... Isaiah 29 verse 15 says, Woe to them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Yahweh, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? And this has always been the problem with mankind, that people think that they can disobey God and get away with it, that God doesn't see it. When you read Psalm 10, the mind of the wicked says, God does not see, God does not care, God will not judge me. And you find that theme right through Psalm 10. That's the mind of the wicked, that no one actually sees us. And yet that's not true, because God does see it. God sends his angels, and it says in verse in Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of Yahweh are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And so God's eyes are sent through the, the earth, and we know that is in the presence of the angels. In the second of Chronicles 16, verse 9, we have a, the, the denunciation by Hanani the prophet of Asa, the king of Israel, king of Judah. And, and he had very foolishly tried to make a league with, with different armies to protect himself instead of going and appealing to God as Hezekiah did. And in the denunciation of, of that particular king, this is what the prophet said. For the eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect or mature towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And so the king was condemned to, to end his life in disgrace and, and failure because he put his confidence in hiring mercenary armies rather than going and placing the matter before his God. But importantly, we notice that God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and good. And so God's angels are everywhere and they are reporting back to God. They ascend and they descend back to earth when they have spoken to the Father about the things that they have seen and observed. And, and that's just a way of us understanding that God is in every place. Well, let's talk about Abraham and the Yahweh angel. This is a, a classic illustration of, of Yahweh, the Yahweh angel, working with one particular man, Abraham. And I want you to notice in this passage that this is when the angel had come to Abraham to announce the birth of Isaac that was impending, um, but also to tell him about the destruction of Sodom. 
And what we see here is a great example of angelic concern and cooperation. Now in Genesis 18, we're told that when, the, when two of the angels had departed towards Sodom, it says in Genesis 18 very clearly that Abraham stood with the angel. For example, in Genesis chapter 18, and the men, that is the other two angels, turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. So we know they were angels because they were angels when Lot received them. They went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. So here's the angel calmly standing, looking down upon Sodom, and, and Abraham is there standing alongside of him. So you've got this very personal encounter between Abraham and the Yahweh angel. And the Yahweh angel is thinking about whether or not he should inform Abraham about what is going to happen. And I want you to notice this was not automatic. He had to think it through. He had to make a decision on the spot. And this is angelic initiative, which we'll talk about later on. This angel, with all the, the authority of God vested in him, still has to think through what he's doing. And so he says to himself, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations there shall be blessed in him. And look at this beautiful comment, for I know him. So that just shows you how much the angels are aware of us and they know us. I know him, that he will actually use this wisely in his house. His children will be taught to keep the ways of Yahweh. This will be a great example for him to use of how God can work in the earth, of how God will destroy the wicked, and, and that God intends to bring blessing upon the house of Abraham. This is going to be good for Abraham, says the angel to himself. And so he decides to tell Abraham that which he's about to do. And and, you know, Abraham is now very concerned about this. And, and so he then goes through a process of negotiating with the angel to bring down the number that might be able to save the city of Sodom. And it's a very torturous process that they go through. But the angel is gracious and the angel is very caring in that process. But I want to just take up this aspect about knowing. For I know him, said the angel. Now, these are comments from the Apostle Paul. We now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. So our experience of connecting to God is like looking into a mirror in the dark. But there's going to come a time when, when we'll see clearly, face to face. Now I know in part, then shall, we, then shall I know fully, even as I have been fully known, says Paul. So, you know, there's going to come a time when, when we're actually going to have a greatly enhanced a connection to our God, face to face. But we are known now. Paul says that as I am now known, and we're going to come to actually see the other side of the story, to know God and the angels personally in the future. But now we see through a glass darkly, so it's, it's, it's look a very um, incomplete picture, but then face to face, now I know in part that I shall know even as I am known. So we are known completely by God and his angels now. They understand us. They know the way we think. They know our motivations. They can work on us as they do through life. But the day will eventually come when we actually reciprocate that connection to them and actually know as we are known by them. Very beautiful thought about, I know him, said the angel. And of course, again, getting back to Zechariah, that beautiful promise to the servants of God in the days of Zechariah, you shall know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me unto you. So we're actually going to actually have a, a great enhancement of our knowledge and an understanding just how much God has done in our lives and brought us to the point of his kingdom. We shall know. And that's about the angel knowing Abraham. Well, without going through the detail of the story, we see that the angels go to Lot and they accept his hospitality. Um, obviously, Lot saw something about these visitors that was different to Sodom and insisted they come home. Lot then prepares them a meal and they accept his hospitality. Lot then prepares them beds and they actually prepare to, to go and lie down which is, is a great example of angelic graciousness. And we'll talk about that when we come to that further on in the, in the story about how gracious the angels were in accepting Lot's hospitality. They didn't need his food. They didn't need his bed. They said, we could, we could stand on the street all night. We don't need what humans need. But nevertheless, they were prepared to go along with Lot's hospitality. But then, of course, they had to then blind the men who were banging on the door with evil intent. And then they had to take Lot and his family by the hand. But before that, they were very patient with Lot, giving him time to go and reason with the rest of his family. There were daughters and sons-in-law that were not present, and Lot went out to see them and tried to reason with them about the impending judgment that was coming. 
but they would not hearken to him. But the angels knew that. They knew that there would be no outcome, but they gave him a chance to do it. And it's just a little useful thought about some of us who have relatives not in the truth uh, as to what might happen at the end of time. But patient reasoning, again, very calmly, but the time was coming when they had to move. So in the end, we read this, and, and this is where we need, again, to read our Bible carefully. While Lot lingered, verse 16 of Genesis chapter 19, the men or the angels laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and the hand of his two daughters. So the angels in, in the end had one in each hand. So no one could actually uh, fall behind. They were actually taken by the hand. Yahweh being merciful to him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So they took him right outside the city. In fact, they actually got into Zoah before the destruction fell. So the whole four of them went into Zoah, and then Lot's wife came out of the city of Zoah, leaving the protection of the angels, and was destroyed in the Holocaust. So I want you to notice, though, that it says, they brought him forth and set him without the city. And here's the case of careful Bible reading. Have you ever noticed this in verse 17? When they had brought them forth, that he said. You notice it's gone back to the singular pronoun, because now the angels have met the Yahweh angel. This one that had been talking to Abraham had now come down, as he said he would, and he's waiting for his two companions to bring out Lot and his family. And now a judgment has to be made, and the Yahweh angel is the one who makes this judgment. He's the one who decides whether or not he can spare this city or that city. And so Lot pleads with the Yahweh angel that he can actually go into Zohar, and that is approved, even though, of course, that was not exactly what God originally intended. But for Lot's sake and for his fears, the angel exceeds and lets him go into Zohar. And so we read the sun in verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zohar. Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, fire and brimstone from heaven, and he overthrew those cities. And so the Yahweh angel now calls down the fire and brimstone that God had decreed. But all along, it was about Abraham and Lot. When we come down to verse 29, it says, It came to pass when, when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain that God, the Elohim remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And again, there is that lovely connection to Abraham. The angel remembered Abraham and sent Lot out. And even though Lot was a righteous man, it was mainly for the sake of Abraham that this rescue had taken place. But notice, and, and just notice that in verse 17, the two angels bring out Lot and his family, and there's an angel waiting for them. He is the one that gives directions from here on. He is the one that spares Zohar. He is the one that then brings down the fire from heaven. So this mighty angel is there all along. So just notice that when they had brought him forth, that he said, escape for thy life. So God remembered Abraham. Later on, we find in Genesis 22, in the case of the offering of Isaac, that the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. So the angel having directed this sacrifice to take place, intervenes at the last moment. Seeing that Abraham is willing to go through with it, he then stops Abraham from doing it. And of course, all along, there was a ram stuck in a thicket. And you can imagine the fun angels have sometimes doing things like that, that at this particular place, there was a ram prepared, caught by his horns in a thicket alongside of the place of sacrifice. Later on, Abraham would say to his servants these words, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee. So again, there's the confidence of Abraham that an angel would go before his servant in this quest to find a wife for Isaac. So you can see that the angels were very active in the life of Abraham. Well, it continued in the case of Hagar. When Hagar was cast out, the angel of Yahweh found her in the wilderness. So again, this is the angel now looking for this person who's come from Abraham. She is the mother of Abraham's seed in the case of Ishmael. And God heard the voice of the lad because he was the son of Abraham. And the angel of God called to Hagar. And again, you see the angel rescuing Hagar from a very dreadful situation in which Abraham's seed could have been uh, allowed to die. Again, angelic care and ministration. The angels are very good at ministration and caring for people in their times of struggle. Think of the case of Elijah. 
Elijah greatly depressed because of the reaction of Jezebel, perhaps going through a, a, a tremendous um, down, down letting after the great events on Mount Carmel. This often happens with human beings when they've been through a great trauma, they're running before the chariot of Ahab, greatly excited and coming to a point where they actually have lost all resolve to continue. And so Elijah runs away and he goes down to a journey towards Horeb, but he takes six whole weeks to get there. It should have been less than a fortnight, perhaps only a few days for a single man. So here was Elijah going through a period of great personal depression. And then an angel touches him and there's a meal prepared, arise and eat. So while Elijah's going through a very classic depression of feeling that he's unworthy, that he's useless and not eating, rejecting the company of, of his servant, very much feeling alone. For that six-week journey that he eventually took to get to Mount Horeb, the angel was with him all the way. It says he ate of that meat uh, all the way to Horeb. And so every time that he was woken up, there was a food prepared for him. And again, you get a case of angelic ministration. With our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that after the temptation, angels came and ministered unto him. And then, of course, he had to be virtually alone. He was not to have any face-to-face -face meetings with angels during his ministry because he was showing us the way how to serve God in the days of our flesh. And uh, we don't meet angels face-to-face, -face, so he didn't meet any angels during that three and a half years from his ministry. So having been restored from the weakness of the temptation, he then was taken by the angels and, and for three and a half years, he was virtually alone without any direct revelation of angels until he'd won the battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he'd overcome his own natural instincts, accepted the will of God, and then an angel came from heaven to strengthen him. And notice again, that angel came directly from heaven. So sent from the Father to speak to him and to give him much assurance from the scriptures about what lay ahead and what lay beyond. Again, the angels, their care administrations in serving God upon the earth. When we come to the apostles, we find that with the apostles, there was a great involvement of the angels. On the Mount of Olives, after Jesus was taken up, two men stood by them in white apparel. And very likely that was Gabriel and Michael, the same two that had been in the tomb when Mary looked into the tomb. The angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors in, in Acts chapter 4. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. The spirit or the angel caught Philip away in Acts chapter 8, verse 39, transporting him some 40 miles away. Cornelius had a visit from an angel. An angel of God, we're told, came to Cornelius. Peter is rescued from prison again by an angel in Acts chapter 12 and verse 7. And then, of course, Persec the proud persecutor Herod, who had already killed James the apostle, is cut down by the angel of God in Acts 12 and verse 23. But again, just notice the balance. With all of these people, there was deliverance for some and not always for others. The apostle James was killed. Stephen was stoned. So in God's plan and purpose, sometimes he delivers and sometimes he doesn't. And we don't need to start questioning why. We need to accept that that's how it is with God. Sometimes he wants people to live long lives like John. In other cases, like James, his brother, he was to have a very short life of apostleship. In God's eyes, it's not the length of our, our service, it's the quality of our service. When you come to the Apostle Paul, he was incredibly conscious of the help of God in his life. He says in Acts 26, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. So again, there is there's that consciousness of God working in his life. On the ship, there stood by me the angel of the Lord. And then Paul expressed it this way of how we work with God. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as the great master builder or architect, I have laid the foundation. So Paul is a builder on the work site. God is the great architect. God has the great plan. And God is using us to put that plan into action. And so Paul says we are laboring together with God, and that's working with the angels. He was always conscious of God's help. When we look at some of the writings of Paul and the statements of Paul, we find that there are times when Paul actually rehearsed all that God had done with them 
and opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And all through his life, Paul was incredibly impressed by how much God was working in his life. So when we go out and do the things that God requires us to do, and especially preaching, we can be assured that God is working in our lives in those circumstances because we're doing his revealed will. We've got to be careful about bringing God into the personal circumstances of life because God doesn't always take interest in our personal circumstances. But when it's about preaching the word, then God is, is directly interested. And there are many brethren and sisters who have gone to mission fields know exactly that they probably never felt more the hand of God in their lives than they were engaged on the work of preaching the truth and supporting the converts. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Some of the things that happen in mission fields uh, are incredibly interesting and incredibly coincidental, you might say, and would have to be the work of angels. And, and there are plenty of personal examples of things like that. So God is working for us when we do that, which is his declared will. Paul was very aware of the angels right through his life. He said, we're made a spectacle or a theatre unto the world and to angels and to men. So he very much worked in the sight of the angels. When he was talking about the head covering in the Corinthians 11, for this cause of the woman, and he's talking about to the woman in the ecclesia to have authority on her head, the symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In other words, in the beginning, the angels created the woman to support the man. That was the divine order, even before sin. It was reinforced after sin. And so there has to be an acknowledgement in the symbols that we have in our ecclesial circumstances. The woman has that symbol of authority, her authority to demonstrate the relationship of, of the ecclesia to Christ. The man demonstrates the relationship of Christ to God. And there are different roles that have to be displayed. But the angels are watching that. In fact, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, verse 21, Paul talks about the need for us to behave ourselves in the ecclesia because there are elect angels or special angels that actually have the control over the ecclesias. And these elect angels are angels that would be working with many other angels. When you have an ecclesia perhaps of 100 persons, then there are 100 angels and there has to be a lot of interaction between those angels to work on common goals and not to actually overlap with each other too much. And so I believe you have an elect angel looking after each ecclesia, which if, is interesting when you come to the symbology of Revelation 2 and 3. You are come by faith, says Paul in Hebrews, to an innumerable company of angels. And that's part of our hope is that we're going to be joined and be made equal to that great company of angels that are today working with us and with God in the earth. So there are many ways angels can help us, and we will develop some of these in our future studies. Assisting our desire to teach our children. Remember, I know Abraham that he will teach his family. Answering our prayers for others. You see the case in Genesis 19 that Abraham prayed for Lot. And in Genesis 25, you see that you find Isaac prayed for his wife and both those prayers were heard. Blessing and guiding those who diligently seek the, the, the spiritual welfare of their brethren. That was Joseph. He was guided on that mission to redeem his brethren. Responding to faithful prayers in the case of a wife for Isaac. There was this angel sent forth and the work of Eliezer was guided by the angel to find the right woman and to bring her back as a bride for the son of Abraham. In the case of Daniel, when he had a burning desire to understand the visions of God, an angel was sent to him. Uh, fervent ecclesial prayers for Peter were answered and delivering our dust from evil was the case of David. So there are many things the angels do and we'll look at some more of those examples in later studies.